please help me welcome the person who believes that each of us is more powerful than we think they are, <laughs> Eric Liu. Thank you so much, Nanette. And um, uh, Don, um, thank you um, for making it possible for me to join you, but also for us to be gathered here. Um, uh, Don was mentioning uh, this is, of course, the 25th anniversary event, and sounds like Nanette was very involved in the 20th anniversary event for IPT. Um, but I learned, uh, just before we got started here, that uh, they recently celebrated their uh, uh, 46th uh, wedding anniversary. So let's give them a round of applause for that. <laughs> You are an inspiration uh, on many levels, uh, and that's really true uh, because I think, uh, you know, you all wouldn't be here in this room uh, if you didn't uh, appreciate not only the work and the charge that uh, IPT has had these 25-plus uh, uh, years, uh, but uh, to recognize the quality and the caliber of leadership and the character uh, of Don and Annette uh, in uh, curating the work of this organization. Um, I also just want to say, uh, uh, in acknowledging Jennifer's uh, remarks earlier this morning, um, that it's really great to be back in Oklahoma. Um, I uh, began my career uh, when I graduated from college uh, working for an Oklahoma politician, uh, a guy named David Boren, uh, who at the time was a United States Senator, a Democrat from Oklahoma, um, and uh, at the time was Chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, and my first uh, uh, work out of college was uh, as a lowly research assistant uh, on the Senate Intelligence Committee staff uh, and ended up moving from the committee staff to work for Senator Bourne in his, uh, his personal Senate office as a legislative aide. And uh, those of you who are Oklahomans know uh, that uh, Senator Bourne uh, was a, uh, a great public official uh, in the Senate, but he left the Senate in 1996 uh, and uh, became the president of the University of Oklahoma, where he has been uh, till just this academic year uh, when he retired. Um, and so both literally as a teacher uh, at OU, but uh, more figuratively, just in his entire public life and career, he's been a mentor and a teacher to an incredible web uh, of people, uh, certainly across this state, and I would say around the country. Um, and uh, again, not all of you here, in fact, very few of you might be Oklahomans, but I, I want to name that because I think it's really important to name where we come from uh, and who it is who shapes us and who it is who forms us. And uh, on my kind of roll call of those guiding lights, uh, David Bourne is, uh, is, is high on the list. Um, and I think it's important to name these things because we are in, as Nanette was saying, this moment of upheaval right now, this period where everything feels so completely disoriented and disorienting. And that's certainly true of the circus that is national politics, but it's also true of just economic life as well, uh, where people uh, over the last, actually over these 25 years plus, uh, have had all their moorings shaken out from under them, all their sense of not only social contract, but social place, uh, their sense of predictability and their sense of uh, path and belonging uh, in economic life, as creators, as producers, as consumers, uh, all come into question. And this period now of this kind of upheaval uh, has built this culture where all of us have gotten into this mindset where uh, we look around uh, and there is this contagion of zero-sum scarcity thinking, this contagion of every man for himself kind of thinking, and this contagion that says, oh, wow, this, uh, this economy is getting all tilted. It's becoming a winner-take-all game, and I don't feel like a winner right now, so i got to really elbow out the guy next to me. i got to not help out the person who looks like they might be suffering. i got to make sure I'm just looking out for number one. And in that kind of culture and in that kind of ethical environment, which has unfolded under Democratic and Republican administrations over the last several decades, in that kind of environment, we forget who we are. We forget where we came from. We forget what it means to be rooted in a sense of values uh, that are greater than just shareholder value. And so I think it's really important just to situate ourselves in this moment. Uh, and of course, I don't need to tell you. Uh, you, you all are a room of people who are uh, finely expert uh, in the texture of our economy right now. But uh, the other, of course, fundamental fact of our moment is that we're living in a time 
uh, of the greatest concentration of wealth, the most severe levels of inequality this country has seen since just before the Great Depression. And in the case of the Great Depression, that was not just correlation, it was causation. That when you have an economy that is this tipped over, this concentrated, where this much of the lifeblood of the body politic and the body economic is coursing through one tiny portion of the body. In 1980, the, the wealthiest 1% of Americans accounted for 8% of national income. Today, it's over 20%. If 20% of my lifeblood were coursing through my pinky, my pinky would feel like it was doing pretty great, right? <laughs> It would say, yeah, I'm styling. Like looking at the other fingers on the hand, it would be kind of saying, I feel pretty good. Until that moment when the rest of my body, for lack of blood, collapsed to the ground and died. And then the pinky would realize, oh, that was kind of a nice little bubble moment. But I am connected to the body, right? And that is the moment we're in right now where people are recognizing, again, this, and this concentration, this gross distortion has unfolded. This is not a partisan comment. This has unfolded under Republican and Democratic administrations, and it's unfolded in a time where market capitalism has lost its checks and balances. And this moment that we're in as well is a moment that, because of this kind of economic upheaval, uh, if you think about, you know, speaking of anniversaries, 10 years now past the failure of Lehman, 10 years past the great financial crisis. Uh, so 10 years out, we can see that every upheaval of our politics and culture is also related to this gross distortion in the economy. That we have Occupy Wall Street, we have the Tea Party, we have the rise of Donald Trump and populists on the right, we have the rise of Bernie Sanders and populists on the left, all derived from this great big bang of severe radical inequality and concentration of wealth. And so for those of you who are regulators in this room, many of your jobs, many of your offices were literally born of a comparable moment, were literally offices that were created during the populist movement, during the progressive era 100, 120 years ago, post the Great Depression. Many of your offices were created to reckon with just this kind of economic and social crisis and the catastrophes that follow just this kind of concentration of wealth, income, opportunity, voice, and power. And so I think one of the things that we've got to remember in thinking about this moment is that this moment is, is not just today. Right? Here we are, thankfully, reading the headlines that Hurricane Florence got downgraded to a tropical storm and, it, uh, and only five people uh, apparently had died uh, uh, in the course of the first day. Uh, but I think, as we've been seeing, in the, you know, as we see more and more often now with the rise of these megastorms and natural disasters, uh, there was a very smart op-ed in the New York Times yesterday, some of you may have seen, about how we define disaster, right? And the death toll of a disaster. Is the death toll of a disaster how many people die on the day of landfall? Or is the death toll of a disaster how many people die as a result of the immediate radiating effects of that disaster, right? So if you define it only as the day of the disaster, well, on, you know, September 2008, when Lehman fell, yeah, a bunch of people's portfolios went sour. That was a bad day for a lot of people. But I think my point is that we have to define the consequences and the radiating effects of 2008 in a much more capacious, much more systemic and interdependent way and realize we are still living with those consequences, and that that is a matter of sight and how we see. It's a matter of our civic imagination, right? And again, for all of you who are regulators, this is in the marrow of the offices you run or serve. And for those of you who work in other dimensions of investor protection, consumer education, looking out for elders, and, uh, and, and, and fighting against predatory uh, forms of uh, financial engagement, for all of us right now, we've got to recognize that it's important to take the systemic view of things. I, 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 I set this up in this kind of lengthy way because <clears throat> the work that I do at Citizen University and the work that I do in writing books like the one that uh, 
uh, thanks to Don and Annette and this organization that you all have now, um, is all about, yes, citizen power uh, and about the ways in which we see and conceptualize and understand uh, our own power, uh, but it's more broadly about how we imagine ourselves and what stories we tell about ourselves as woven into a social fabric. So let me back up a step and just tell you about this work uh, and about the way that we think about this work. And what I want to do then is talk a bit about power itself uh, and, and three laws of power, the way they play out uh, in every circle of civic and economic life. Uh, and then three imperatives for action uh, that derive from those laws uh, for, for you all in this room to, uh, to commit to. So this work at Citizen University, all our work, uh, we're a nonprofit, we're based in Seattle, but we do work all around the United States. <clears throat> and our work is fundamentally about trying to foster a culture of powerful citizenship and to democratize understanding of how power works in civic life. And so I do not come here as a financial expert. I do not come here as a practitioner of uh, retirement uh, uh, policy. But I come here, actually, as somebody whose work is quite, quite aligned with your own. Because the democratization of an understanding of how power works is another way of defining the mission statement of the Investor Protection Trust. Again, I don't need to recite the, the statistics to you. You know that only one in three Americans actually hold taxable uh, investments, that there is, and that the other, maybe roughly third, who have uh, stocks and bonds, ha have them through mutual uh, accounts and the like. And you know the shockingly low levels of financial literacy that abound across a society, even among those who actually hold these investments, much less among uh, the, the many who don't. And again, I know over the course of the last day and a half, you've been hearing reports about not only the silver tsunami and the demographic bulge that's going to uh, create great problems for our economy, but the ways in which here and now, the opportunity to participate in an investor economy, in an ownership society, so to speak, uh, is itself skewed toward the affluent, toward the white toward those who actually were raised in families that had exposure to this kind of power. And so your work is fundamentally about boosting literacy in power. Not just boosting literacy in the stock market and boosting literacy in retirement accounts, but boosting literacy in power. Now, I define power as a capacity to ensure that others do as you would like them to do. And to a lot of people, that definition is a little bit uh, kind of creepy sounding or domineering or a little bit, you know, dirty, right? And I would just say, if any of you have qualms about that very candid definition, it's time to get over it. Because one of the, mo one of the signature aspects of our moment right now is that a lot of people are getting over it. A lot of people are recognizing that in the economy, in our workforce, in our education system, in our criminal justice system, in every set of institutions across our society, the game is rigged. And across the board, people are saying, I no longer consent to playing in a rigged game. That is what led to the surge of populism on both the right and the left. And that is what is leading to the upheaval in our politics as we speak right now. The sense that, A, we recognize the game to be rigged, but B, we no longer tolerate it. We no longer treat this simply as a condition of nature, as a God-given aspect of our lives. We see this as something that is both changeable and must be changed. And we demand it. Frederick Douglass said famously that power concedes nothing without a demand. And the age that we live in right now is an age of bottom-up demands from across the board. It's not just, as I said earlier, Occupy Wall Street and the Tea Party a decade ago. It's not just the Trump train and the Sanders movement. It is everything from Me Too, Black Lives Matter, Dreamers, the fight for 15. It is the fight among libertarians now to carve out a new space to break the duopoly of liberal and conservative, Republican and Democrat in our politics. All these folks across the board that you can't easily fit into boxes anymore are saying, we demand change and we are claiming our power. 
Well, it's great to have a moment like this, I think. It's exciting. But it also puts a great burden on those of us, like all of us gathered here today, who think that part of our jobs, that indeed the core of our jobs, is to democratize knowledge, is to educate, is to spread literacy. Because the burden for us now is not simply to do as we've been doing before. Right? And our work at Citizen University, in thinking about power this way, and thinking about what it means to exercise power in civic life, turns on the idea that power, as I've defined it, operates by three simple laws. And I want to just spell these out for you. Law number one is very simple, and I've actually described some of its effects. Law number one is this. Power compounds. It concentrates. Right? And I think one of the most basic ways that we understand and conceptualize this is the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And this is not just a 2018 observation. This is as old as scripture in the book of Matthew. This idea that left to themselves, systems will tend toward the haves having more and having so much that they will indeed take from the have-nots. This is the nature of complex adaptive systems, clumping, concentration. And it's not just about wealth and money. It's about clout of all kinds. Those who get some press tend to get more press. Those who get some exposure in Hollywood, tend to get more exposure in every circle. This is the nature of complex adaptive systems. Power compounds. And of course, powerlessness compounds as well. When you've been in a repeated cycle, a generational cycle, of being cut out of a rigged game, the compounding effects of that lag and that gap become, with every turn of the game, that much more difficult to overcome. So that's law number one, power compounds. Law number two is, this, is that power justifies itself. At every turn, incumbent holders of power, whether individuals or institutions, will spin elaborate narratives about why it ought to be that way, about why that is, in fact, the God-given order of things. And those narratives will sometimes take forms that, in hindsight, we can deem ridiculous. In hindsight today, we rational 21st century Americans will say, can you believe there was a time when kings and emperors used to march around and say, I am king or emperor as a matter of divine right because God said I should be king or emperor. Maybe because I am lineally descended from God. And we can look back on that and say, that's hilarious that people used to say that and that people used to believe that. But we have our own versions today of divine right, these elaborate structures and stories of self-justification. And I think for those of us who think about the economy, one of the most pernicious and pervasive ones is trickle-down economics. The idea that prosperity emerges from the godlike acts of a handful of blessed job creators, capital J, capital C, and that from their wisdom and benevolence, prosperity leaks its way down to the rest of us. And so that our job as consumers and citizens is not to trouble the job creators, is not to challenge their primacy, not to burden them with regulation or oversight or comments about fiduciary duty or any of that. Get out of the way. Let them create jobs for us. Right? That is a... Again, not a partisan comment. That is an ideology that has been accepted, promoted, believed, and certainly left unchallenged by Republicans and Democrats alike for 30, 40 years now. And, th and that's a doozy of a narrative of self-justification, as I'll get into a little bit more. So if all you've got are these first two laws of power, that power is continually concentrating, as it is in our economy today, and again, when I talk about the fact that the wealthiest 1% now account for 20 plus percent of national income, it's not just that that itself is concerning because the pinky is bulging and ballooning with blood, but the consequences of that politically. There were political scientists from Princeton recently who did a pioneering study looking at the behavior of the United States Congress and the relationship of 
the legislation that Congress enacted and how that related to the preferences of voters and donors. And what the study found was that the things that the Congress of the United States passes are entirely aligned with and driven by the preferences of the very wealthy in the United States. That if you are middle class, you only get what you want from the Congress if what you want happens to also be what the very wealthy want. But if those things are in conflict, sorry, middle class, you lose. Now again, you might think, wow, you needed a Princeton political scientist to tell you this? Right? We feel this in our bones. We know this about the United States Congress. We know this about our state legislatures in every state of the union. But this compounding of power is not just about economic power. It is about how economic power begets political power. Only a tiny handful of people, of citizens, actually contribute to political campaigns. And it is to that subset of citizens that our elected officials are most highly responsive. And so that compounding, coupled with this narrative of self-justification, if all you had were these first two laws of power, that it's always compounding and it's always justifying itself, you'd get into a pretty grim doom loop, right? Where fewer and fewer people are hoarding more and more of all the resource in our society and, to make matters worse, to rub it in, telling you why you ought to enjoy it. Telling you why you ought to think you ought to be grateful for this. Fortunately, what breaks us out of this doom loop is law number three, which is simply this, that power is infinite. Power is infinite. And when I say this, I want to be very clear. I'm not some, you know, yes, I'm from Seattle, but I'm not coming here from Seattle selling you some new age woo-woo line that if we just manifest, you know, if we just imagine it, we can manifest wealth. And that if we just believe, we can change everything merely by the belief. No, I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that at every single turn, it is wholly possible in every domain of civic and economic life to generate brand new power where it did not previously exist in even the most seemingly rigged games. And it is possible to do this through the magic act of organizing. Organizing, inviting one, five, ten, a hundred other humans to join you in some common endeavor, around some common end, requiring some common set of strategies, that act and work of organizing generates power where it did not previously exist. Now, this law, this third law, this idea of the infinitude of power, I grant it cuts against some of the intuitions that we have about the nature of things. A lot of our intuitions about something like power uh, derive from physics. And in physics, we are taught that in a closed system, in a room like this, if someone's going to get more heat, more energy, then someone else has to get less because there's a constant amount of energy in the room. It's the law of thermodynamics. Someone gets more, someone else has to get less. And that is our intuition about power in civic and economic life. But the thing is, I'm not talking physics. I'm talking civics. And in civics, you can add to the net amount of power circulating in a system. You can add to the amount of power that is coursing through that ecosystem. And every one of you in this room is testament to this. Every one of you in this room, serving citizens, educating them on how not to get taken advantage of, on how to understand not only what investments they may have today, but what it might look like to participate in an investment economy. Every one of you, by trying to broaden the reach of financial and economic literacy, in our society. Every one of you is adding, adding new power, adding to the net bottom line of power circulating in the system of your community, of your city, of your state, and of the United States. And this third law of power and its centrality, the way that it turns centrally on organizing, is something that I really want to focus in on. Because you might be thinking here, well, you know, I'm a I work in government. I'm not, a, I'm not a community organizer. That's not my job. Or I run a nonprofit, but we're looking at research and we're studying the economy. I'm not out on the streets doing community organizing. Stop. If that's where your mind is going, stop. Every one of you 
by being an educator, every one of you by being a regulator, every one of you by being an advocate, every one of you by being somebody who has the social, intellectual, political, and civic capital to be in a room like this, every one of you is an organizer. Every one of you is inviting people who are not previously activated to become activated. Every one of you is inviting people who previously are either completely cut out of the game or are merely interested bystanders to step out onto the field. Now, I, again, it's true that once they're on the field, once they get off the sidelines, that's a whole other body of work about what you got to teach them to do and how to play and how not to get blindsided and how not to get rolled over on the field. But the fact that you are trying to get folks on the field, Nanette was telling me about how in a lot of the both presentations and the hallway conversation uh, up till uh, this point in your, in your convening, uh, a, a running theme in addition to just the tectonic demographic boom of the baby boom uh, aging and the fact that our retirement structure is, uh, is headed for a collapse and a crash, uh, is, the, is the racial inequity of the entire system and the ways in which what we commonly call underserved communities are not participating as investors, and to the extent they might be, are not getting access to the protection, to the education that so many of you here are offering. And what I want to say about that is that I have a friend who, uh, a longtime artist and citizen artist and organizer through the arts, Vivian Phillips, and she has this great line, uh, because in the arts, people are always thinking similarly about underserved communities, and that term is used over and over again. And her line is this, the underserved are the uninvited. Stop calling them underserved. Just start inviting them. Start inviting them in creative ways. Start inviting them with far more innovative forms of invitation. You are organizers, right? And so these three laws of power that number one, it concentrates, number two, it's continually self-justifying, but that number three, it is in fact infinite, and so it is possible to change the system. Each of these three laws of power yields an imperative for action. And I want to run quickly through these imperatives for action. Because they bear so much now on the work that you've been doing, and I think the work now that you've got to do in the way perhaps that you might want to think differently about how to do it. So if in the first place power is always compounding and concentrating into these winner-take-all games, well, of course, your first imperative is to change the game. What does it mean to change the game? You can say, <clears throat> well, changing the game is, yes, having better rules and rules like the fiduciary rule, which I know has been undermined, but doesn't mean that uh, you all still can't be pushing that idea, that <laughs> simple common sense idea as a matter not only of law, but as a matter of culture and ethics. That someone in the business of providing investment services and counsel ought to be acting in the best interests of the client in an undivided way. Wow, right? Yes, changing the game is about pushing for rule changes like that. Yes, changing the game is about making sure that institutions like the Consumer Prote uh, Protection Financial Bureau are not gutted and neutered, that actually they managed to maintain some capacity to do what they were designed to do. But I think there's a bigger game at work here. And there's a bigger game that I want to invite all of you, whatever your position might be, whether you're in government, whether you might be elected, whether you are in nonprofits or in the private sector. And the bigger game is the riggedness of our economy itself. And that people like us in this room who have the power and have the literacy that we have cannot just be content with rearranging deck chairs right now because the Titanic is heading toward an iceberg. We've got to figure out how we get this ship to change course. And you might say, well, <clears throat> that's not my job. That's above my pay grade. I'm not steering the ship. I'm but a steward on the Titanic. And we are in a moment right now, the corollary to being in this moment of, a of the surge of bottom-up power pushing up against establishment hierarchies, pushing up against the old status quo. The corollary to that is that every one of us now is the captain. Every one of us now has a responsibility to lead. Every one of us 
if we see that we're headed toward an iceberg, has a responsibility not only to say something, but to do something. And I want to invite everyone in this room. Again, I know that for some of you, some of what I'm beginning to say here sounds like some left-wing socialist, even, economic agenda. It is not. I'm a big capitalist. Capitalism has been very good to me. I love the idea that solutions emerge from a marketplace in which the maximum number of fit and able competitors are on that field competing. I love the idea of capitalism. But the thing about capitalism, you know, I'm reminded of a Mahatma Gandhi uh, during his struggle to liberate India was once asked, uh, what do you think of Western civilization? Uh, and he replied, I think it would be a good idea. <laughs> and, and I would say, what do you think of truly competitive capitalism? And I would say, I think it would be a good idea. But we don't have that. We don't have a marketplace where anybody with talent can actually participate. We don't have an economic arena where everybody has equal opportunity. We don't have an economic arena where small firms get to compete against monopolies and duopolies. We have, at every fractal level, a rigged game. Let's take one tiny example of this. I mean, here we are. The economy's doing great. The Dow's over 26,000. Median income in the United States has climbed for the third consecutive year. Yay! Right? But when that Dow is above 26,000, what is that actually a sign of? What that's a sign of is not just confidence and the general underlying health of the economy. It is that in some ways. But what it's also a sign of is that there are so many corporations in the United States who, having received a giant, unbidden tax windfall, are, in fact, not using that tax windfall to invest in plant, to invest in their own operations, to invest in the pay and the training and the education of their own workforce. They're directing that giant tax windfall into stock buybacks. It's like in pro sports when you get a plasma-rich injection of your own blood to pump back into your body to make yourself feel a little bit stronger. That's what's happening to our economy right now. So the Dow's doing great because companies, of which I am a shareholder, are buying back their stock and everything's going up in that way. Part of your job now is not just to educate folks on the differences between bonds and stocks and what happens to stock to bond prices when interest rates go up. Yes, I know that <laughs> there's painfully low numbers of people who even know that basic level of stuff. But your job increasingly now is to challenge the game as it is. And not because you are a left-wing socialist, but because you are a capitalist who believes that the way to save capitalism is to save it from its own worst tendencies, to eat itself. You've got to be the ones to put those brakes. You've got to be the ones to make the business case for this kind of norm setting and rule setting. So that's imperative number one, changing the game. If in the second place, power is always justifying itself and spinning these elaborate narratives of why things are the way they are and why that's the God-given way of things, then your second imperative is to change the story. Now, I said earlier, one of the great signal stories of American life is this story of trickle-down economics that takes so many different forms. And it is, it's nearly invisible to most people. It is the water through which we swim as fish. But it is possible now, and we are seeing across the country. And I will tell you, I've had a hand in creating a new story. And it sounds simple, but a new story is necessary because it's not enough just to say, hey, this old story, it's problematic, or it's, it's not fair, or it's just, you know, it, it, it's rigging things. You can't beat something with nothing. And if you're going to change the story, you have to have an affirmative alternative story. In Seattle, in my own life as a citizen, not in my work at Citizen University, just as my, in my life as a resident 
of one of the biggest boom towns in the United States right now, being driven by this incredible tech surge that, it's, that itself is being driven by our friends at Amazon. Seattle just passed San Francisco as the city with the highest, with the worst Gini coefficient. We're the, we're, we are now the most unequal city in the United States. And you see it everywhere. You see it in housing prices, you see it in traffic, you see it in the homelessness on every street in every neighborhood. Well, in Seattle, a group of folks who were low-wage workers in the town of SeaTac, which is the neighboring town where the airport is, a group of people working in the airport industry, in the hospitality industry, a mainly immigrant, mainly women of color workforce, decided, you know what? We're going to tell a different story. And they started organizing. And they started saying, it's time for a higher minimum wage. And that group of folks in SeaTac organized successfully a ballot measure in SeaTac to raise the minimum wage to $15. And you know that was like the shot fired at Lexington. When, when that happened, well, as it happened, neighboring Seattle was in the midst of mayoral and city council elections. And so as soon as SeaTac in September passed $15, everybody in Seattle realized, OK, this is where we're headed. And all of a sudden, the story changed. And in this, and in this fight for 15, the ways in which both these low-wage workers and then ultimately those of us in Seattle. I served on the commission in Seattle that actually orchestrated uh, our $15 minimum wage and made Seattle the first major city in the United States to, ha to, to hit 15. In this work, both on the ground, knocking on doors and telling people why this mattered, and also in talking crucially to investors, business leaders, small business leaders, big business leaders, about this, we told a different story about why this mattered. But the story we told was not, hey, we got all these folks who are working really hard, and we got to be nicer to them. Right? That's been the old story about raising the minimum wage. It was a story of kindness and compassion. And it was always insufficient to overcome the dominant force of the trickle-down economic story, which says, well, as an employer, you could make me raise wages, but if you do that, I'm going to have to lay off people. Sorry. It's zero sum. You force me to pay people more, I will hire fewer people. Right? And so the kindness argument was never enough to overcome that trickle-down story. What we came up with instead was an alternative narrative that said that raising the minimum wage was not just about kindness and compassion, that raising the minimum wage was going to be great for business. Why? For a very simple ecosystemic reality, for this reason. When workers have more money, businesses have more customers. That sounds so simple. When workers have more money, businesses have more customers. When someone goes from making 9 to 11 to 13 or 15, where do you think they're parking that extra 3 or $5 an hour? You think they're parking it in their offshore accounts in the Cayman Islands? Do you think they're putting it in complex securities, real estate investments? No. They're parking an extra three or five bucks an hour in getting their kids actual, actually new clothes for the start of school, in taking their spouse out to an anniversary dinner, in actually making rent on time. That money circulates right back into the economy. And the alternative to that, the alternative to keeping wages artificially low, to suppressing wages and treating workers merely as costs rather than as participants and creators of value and wealth, the alternative is one in which, again, in the end, a very few people have most of the wealth and a very large number are merely scraping to get by. And the story we told was that that's not what Seattle wants to be when Seattle grows up. We want to be a place where it is possible, where it is in fact necessary to remember that we're all better off when we're all better off. And that is not some left-wing socialist idea. That is as good old-fashioned a capitalist idea as Henry Ford. Henry Ford, when he was building Ford, when he was automating 
auto manufacturing. He paid his workers far more than the prevailing wage. Why? Not because he was an altruist or a philanthropist, because he, but because he understood that if he did that, those folks would be able to buy Ford motor cars. That this would be good for his business, it would be good for the economy, and that it would create this ever-increasing virtuous circle of rising demand. This is a different story. And for all of us who work in the economy and talk about investments, we can't just confine ourselves to the narrow parameters of do you know how to read a proxy statement. We have to ask ourselves, proxy for what? Proxy for what kind of game? And how do we change the game? And how do we different, tell a different story about this game? Well, then finally, if power is infinite, and yet so many people are stuck in this zero-sum mentality that says, well, no, no, power is finite. And if somebody gets more, I'm going to get less. If I claim more, I'm going to be taking away from somebody else. And so the imperative for action here is to change the equation. And the way we do that is at every turn to be thinking about how do we build not zero-sum, but positive-sum outcomes. And we do that by promoting reciprocity, by promoting mutual aid. Now, mutual funds use the language of mutuality, but mutual funds actually are a pretty good exhibit of the ways in which most Americans, whether as citizens or as economic actors, are disempowered. Because as a mutual fund owner, I'm just an owner of a slice of a slice of something. And I have no particular agency over how my slice gets aggregated with the slices of you and you and you to actually push for change. So that if through my mutual fund, I own a share of Amazon, and I'm not particularly happy with how Amazon is treating its warehouse workers. Well, how am I actually going to do anything about that? My point something share of Amazon in my mutual fund, which is fluctuating from day to day, how do I aggregate that? How do I find anybody else is doing that? Right? And so our jobs here today is to promote a spirit of mutuality that is not just the language of mutual funds, but is about how do we actually help consumers investors, would-be investors, and participants in the economy join up with one another to aggregate their voice, to share their knowledge. Right? The knowledge isn't just trickling down from you who are experts. The knowledge increasingly, and our technology platforms make this more possible, is going to be shared peer-to-peer, colleague-to-colleague, community-to-community. How do we do this? How do we create circles of mutual aid? One of the things that we have to be able to do is to get comfortable with the idea that in the same way that unions, look, unions have their downsides. Unions, there's a reason, one of the reasons why unions and unionization are in the life support state that they're in in the United States is their own tendency toward calcification and ossification. Their own tendency toward actually concentration of power and self-dealing. I grant that. But if you want a healthy capitalist economy, you want there to be organized labor. If you want an economy that is not rigged and not tending toward such levels of concentration that it tips over, you want there to be countervailing worker power. You want there to be checks and balances in this ecosystem. And so you want to reform unions? Sure. You want new forms of worker power and worker organizing to emerge as they are starting to? Sure. That's great. But in just the same way, we've got to be thinking about investor power and investor voice. And it's happening in different ways. It's happening, of course, with the most obvious tool available to people as consumers and investors, and that's boycott. A woman named Shannon Coulter started something called Grab Your Wallet, you may have heard of, online. Now, she herself, her motivations are progressive. Uh, and she was organizing people as both consumers and investors to disinvest from companies that were advancing the agenda of the current administration. But of course, the current president of the United States has also been calling on consumers 
to boycott things like the NFL or to boycott firms that promote a view contrary to their own view of what's right in society. Boycott is just the tip of the iceberg of what's happening. And what's happening right now in the world of crowdfunding and crowdsourcing, even though it may not look directly like it's within your purview, all of that, all of those trends are increasing demand among the citizens you serve for new ways to make power more infinite, to organize, to build collective voice, and to create spirit, in a sense, in a practice of this kind of mutuality. So as I say, if we think about what it means to change the game and the story and the equation in our economy, we've got to do so in a way that recognizes that doing this is not anti-capitalist. The IPT was born <laughs> 25 years ago out of a recognition that an economy left to itself was going to tend towards self-dealing, game-rigging, and ultimate collapse. And it was the settlement with the wrongdoers of that time that capitalized the IPT. That's why you all are here. That's why this thing exists. And so we've got to recommit right now to being champions and to being vocal advocates for a new kind of capitalism that is truly inclusive, a new kind of capitalism that recognizes that participation alone is not enough. There are investors who are participating, but in that disaggregated way that I'm talking about, that we've got to foster investor power and consumer power, that protection is not enough. Merely protecting from harm is not enough, that we've got to now challenge a narrative in which shareholder primacy is the God that we worship. Now, I know shareholder primacy is partly a result of a chain of Supreme Court decisions and Chancery Court decisions in Delaware, but I also know that it is a matter of norms and that CEOs in the United States of publicly traded companies if they wanted to, if they wanted to show leadership, and let me put it another way, if they felt more heat from their investors, could say, you know what, I'm not going to take the quarterly view. I'm not going to just goose my balance statement for the here and now. I'm going to take a view that looks out 5, 8, 15, 20 quarters. I'm going to look long term. And I'm going to recognize that my job is not just to boost the stock price. And I grant that as I, as CEO, am conflicted about that, since a great amount of my compensation is derived from my stock price. But my job is not just to do that. My job, actually, as a steward of my corporation and as a steward of the economy of the United States, is to get all of us to be thinking more broadly about stakeholders and not just shareholders. You all are in a prime position to push this idea forward, that shareholder primacy is not only not enough, but that it's actually corrosive to an economy that works and an economy that will last. And that mere protection from the harms and the ills that can arise from a shareholder primacy scheme are not enough. And similarly, regulations are not enough. I know some of you are regulators, and so, you know, when you got a hammer, everything looks like a nail. But this is not just about what we regulate and what we put into public policy. This is fundamentally about culture and about norms. The idea that we're all better off when we're all better off is an idea that owes far more to our faith traditions than it does to the law or the Constitution. The idea that mutual aid and reciprocity sustain a healthy ecosystem have far more to do with the deepest wisdom of human civilization than it does with the requirements of the Securities Exchange Commission or any of your offices. Norms matter. And I want to encourage all of you, even though it may be uncomfortable, to step out of merely the super tangible realm of law and rule and to step into the space of norms and to be raising questions and starting conversations about what kind of norms do we want in an economy. Again, 10 years after 2008, 
10 years after Lehman, 10 years after the financial collapse. We haven't yet really fully had a conversation in this country about the costs of casino capitalism. No one has led that conversation. Barack Obama didn't. Donald Trump isn't. Governors aren't. CEOs aren't. Jamie Dimon sits there now and he brags that he could beat Trump in an election. Whatever. I want Jamie Dimon to lead us in a conversation about, con about casino capitalism. I want all of you to say, okay, 10 years ago, Lehman fell because it was part of an interconnected web of ways in which all of us as citizens had participated in a bubble housing economy. And that all of us thought that we could just keep on slicing, dicing, and passing on down the line debt that got stinkier and worse and more rotten with every resecuritization. We were all participants in that. Jamie Dimon didn't make us do that. And Barack Obama didn't stop us from doing that. We haven't learned a single thing. Now, yeah, there are rules and laws now, maybe, that might make that particular crisis less likely to happen. And there are higher capital requirements. And there are all these things that you know, some of which in Dodd-Frank, some of which in state regulations. That's all great. But what I'm talking about here is the fact that we have not had a full, deep, ethical reckoning. One that actually forces everyday consumers and investors not to see themselves as victims, but to see themselves as co-conspirators in this kind of casino capitalism. That is to say, it's time for us in this room to have more grown-up conversations with the people we are working with and serving. I know a lot of the nature of the work that you do assumes that they aren't grown up, assumes that they are illiterate, assumes that they need to do stuff. And we got to watch out for that because that can be infantilizing. That can say to folks, you don't, have, you, know, you, don't, you don't know any better, so you don't have any responsibility. Right? What has to be part and parcel with any bit of financial literacy education is an economic responsibility education. And again, not to blame the victim of the average American who mainly unwitting, unwittingly participate in this, but particularly the higher we go up in the economic strata, the more forceful we've got to be in demanding this kind of reckoning. So that when you have conversations, not with everyday folks in a workshop about financial education, but when you have conversations with the CEOs in your state, with the Chamber of Commerce in your town, with the business roundtable where you live, that you're forcing open this somewhat awkward conversation about, hey, we still haven't faced facts about the kind of economy and about the ethics of the economy that we've had, and that we are setting ourselves up for a different kind of fall. And finally, the thing that I want to push and nudge all of us to be doing more of is to be recognizing that all of this work is not about the individual. It is about the collective. Our work at Citizen University you know, you take a book title like You're More Powerful Than You Think, and you might think, wow, that's in the great American tradition of self-help. You, individually, are more powerful than you think. And if you just work harder, if you just believe more, if you just get over your bad attitudes, if you just shed your unhealthy habits, you can be more powerful. That's the greatest American storyline there is the rugged individualist storyline. But here we are in the American heartland. Here we are in Oklahoma. And I will tell you from the time that I've spent in Oklahoma, and I will tell you from the work that I've done all around the United States, rugged individualism never got a barn raised. Rugged individualism never got a ranch built. Rugged individualism never got a field irrigated. We've got to begin to talk about collective endeavor again. And to do that in a way that does not automatically make some alarm bells go off of, oh, here comes a socialist. The word collective is, sounds too much like communist. Collective endeavor is what the pilgrims on the Arbella landing at Plymouth Rock believed in. 
collective endeavor is what the framers believed in in Philadelphia when they wrote the Constitution. Collective endeavor is what the United States was built on. Collective endeavor was the landing on Normandy Beach for D-Day. And even though we are fixated on Neil Armstrong planting the flag on the moon, collecting the endeavor was the moon landing. We've got to speak again this language of collective endeavor. Why? Not only because it's good for our country, but because for you who work in this industry and in this space, who are engaged in getting people to think about the game, the story, and the equation of economic life, we've got to get people out of the idea that I individually am on my own navigating this horrible landscape and ecosystem on my own. We together are going to be part of the solution. We together can unrig this game. We together will re-rig this game. And that re-rigging is coming. It may come in flavors that are more moderate or more radical, but the re-rigging is coming. There is no question. And I'm not talking about the 2018 midterms or even the 2020 presidential election. The tectonic underlying forces of our society and economy tell us that a re-rigging is coming. Don't you want to be part of it rather than run over by it? Don't you want to be leading it rather than trampled by it? Don't you want to be sharpening it rather than punctured by it? We've got to do that together. And when we do that, what I want to close with is this simple idea. One thing that we teach in all our work at Citizen University, whether it's people talking about, whether it's low-wage workers trying to organize, whether it's folks from the Tea Party who we've worked with to learn from how they've been sustaining the networks that arose spontaneously in 2008 and 2009, Actually, those of you are Oklahomans, your former, one of your former members of Congress, Tom Cole, is leading this very interesting Tea Party-inspired movement to call for a new constitutional convention, Article 5 Constitutional Convention in the United States. And I personally may disagree with the things that he'd like to see in that constitutional convention, but I am working with and cheering on some of the people he's working with on that endeavor in a group called Citizens for Self-Governance because I love the idea of stirring up bottom-up people power to re-rig the game. In this work that we're doing, across the left and the right, among people who are barely hanging on our economy and among people who are privileged beyond belief in our economy, among all these different dimensions of diversity, one thing we teach is this. Every one of us, Yes, we are more powerful than we think, but every one of us, when we take stock of our own power, and I invite you both individually and in your collective networks to take stock silently of your power. You have money power. Both some of you have money and you know how to move money. You have people power because all of you organize and touch and reach a lot of people and you can change a lot of minds in a, in a hurry. Many of you have the power of state action you can make government do things or not do things. You have social norms power because of your leadership role, because people look up to you. You can set off new contagions of ethics or the lack of ethics. You have all these forms and sources of power. And when you take stock and take inventory of these forms of power that you have, where you live and where you work, once you take a look at that pile of social, intellectual, institutional, economic power, you face a very simple binary choice. And the choice is this. Shall I hoard or shall I circulate? That's it. That is the question of our times. Shall I hoard or shall I circulate? And we wouldn't be in this room if we weren't circulators. So I know I'm preaching to the converted here. But our job has to be to go out there and tell the story this way that we're in a time right now where everybody faces the same binary choice, and that hoarding kills. Hoarding kills not only those who are left out of the hoard, eventually hoarding kills the hoarder too, because just the way that pinky felt at first when it was flooded with blood and hoarding my blood supply, 
eventually, too, that pinky dies when the body itself dies. And so we've got to figure out ways to remember at every level, ethical, programmatic, legal, cultural, political, how to make a great society of circulators, how to rebuild trust and belief in the possibility of circulation. We're all better off and we're all better off is not just an economic statement. It is a statement of the very essence of what it means to be in a social contract. And what I worry about is when the next re-rigging comes, when the next economic and financial collapse comes, and it will come, that we will not be ready as a society and not be able as a society, and we will not have enough stocks and stores of trust to hold together society. We're already in, some people have called a cold civil war because of the polarization of our economy. We ain't seen nothing yet. The kind of fragmentation, the kind of divisiveness, the kind of hate that could get unleashed by the kind of breaking of promises and the breaking of trust in our economy may be too much for our constitutional scheme to bear. And so our responsibility, not to put too fine a point on it, is not just to educate investors, is not just to democratize financial literacy, is not just to improve participation in the economy, is not just to regulate and curb the worst instincts of big players in our economy. No, our charge is this, my friends. It is to save the republic. And I actually think that if we commit to ourselves in gatherings like this, circle after circle, and when you go back home and you find rooms just like this, and you start conversations just like this, we can and we will, because we are, in fact, more powerful than we think. Thank you very much.